Okay, well, that was the uh, rather technical explanation, wasn't it, Dean? But basically, it's teams who finish first versus teams who finish second. Can't be paired with the team you're in a group with. Can't be paired with a team from the same country. It's not hard, is it? No. Even you, with your 10 points, and all your mates all had 10 <laughs> points each, you lot could have done it. We could. We could. Dear, oh dear. Let's bring in uh, one of Talk Sports European experts, Kev Hatchard. Hey, what did you make of that, Kevin? Have you ever seen anything <laughs> so shambolic, really? No, because usually the technology works that backs them up. And as you say, this is a fairly simple process. So for it to have gone this badly wrong is really quite remarkable. And it wasn't just that there was one mistake. It was that it was compounded by another one straight after. Because if they just got it wrong with the Manchester United via Real draw, in theory, that was recoverable because you could just say, OK, well, that couldn't have happened but we'll draw Man City, Villarreal and what have you. But then afterwards, United weren't put back in for the next tie, which meant that Atletico had a better chance of drawing Bayern, which they weren't happy about. And Manchester United could have drawn Atletico, but weren't able to. So they later got PSG. So it's a nightmare for UEFA because it's a really bad look because we know how much, you know, pomp and circumstance there is around uh, you know, these these last 16 draws and the quarterfinal draws and what have you. So, yeah, on their big stage, they messed up big time. Could it have been rectified a lot quicker in the moment still? Or is it a case of they had to go away, figure things out and then come back? No, once the mistake had been made, and it was interesting, the mention of the auditors. Now, this is important because the draw has to be independently audited. And the reason for that is because, you know, this is legally very important to get right because you could have clubs taking legal action because this has financial implications for clubs. Uh, so they had to, I think, once they realised several technical errors had been made, they had to redo the whole draw. Um, so what about the draw itself and just how lucky were Chelsea? <laughs> Very lucky because not only did they get Lille once, they got them twice. And the reason that's good luck for Chelsea is that Lille were able to win what was a wide open group with Sevilla, Wolfsburg and Salzburg. And they did play well in the Champions League, no question about that. But you look at their Liga form and it's poor. You know, this is a team that's 11th in the French top flight right now. They're not the same team that won the league last season under Christophe Galtier, who's moved on to Nice. Jocelyn Gourvenec, who's his replacement, has not been able to get the same kind of consistency from his team. And even though performances have improved a bit more of late, results haven't. And the other thing to bear in mind is that Lille still have financial issues. And as a result of that, may well sell players in January. We think that Jonathan Icone, who's a very exciting player, could go to Serie A. He could join Fiorentina. And there's been talk about Renato Sanchez as well. So I think Chelsea will be utterly delighted with that. How is your look, Real Madrid, Kevin? <laughs> 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 well, I don't think Florentino Perez, the president, will be talking about luck. I imagine no. he's already got it in for UEFA, so he won't be very pleased at all. Real Madrid's... It's a tricky one because Benfica would have been a straightforward tie for them, I think. Because or is it is you... it is it actually PSG that have missed out here? In terms to of... an ex to an extent, yeah, because I think they would have looked at Manchester United and thought that was a winnable tie. I still think Paris have big structural issues anyway. So whoever they came up against, I think it wouldn't be straightforward for them because Mauricio Pochettino hasn't been able to sort out the balance. Between attack and defence, you've still got those superstars in attack, but they don't do enough without the ball. And you look at their performances in Liga. Yes, they've been winning games, but they've very rarely been impressive. In the Champions League, they were outplayed twice by Manchester City, even though they won the game in Paris uh, and then lost the one at the Etihad. So I don't think Paris are playing particularly well. Real Madrid are a fair way clear at the top of La Liga at the moment. They're going very, very well. They won the derby at the weekend against Atletico Madrid. Um, excellent performances from Vinicius Junior, the best season he's had so far, carrying Benzema in the form of his life too. So Real will feel their favourites against Paris. There's so many stories. Sergio Ramos you've got, Carlo Ancelotti used to be the Paris boss, Kylian Mbappe we think is probably going to go to Real Madrid when his Paris contract ends. So there's all kinds of subplots there. It is a fascinating one. I also like the look of Atletico Madrid against Man United, two massive underachievers this season, but... 
by the time they play the tie, Rangnick will probably have worked a little bit of magic, you suspect, at Manchester United, right? I think that's the key. I think the key to this tie is what do the teams do between now and when they play each other? Because if you look at Manchester United, you're absolutely right. Rangnick has to try and get his ideas across to his players. And he also has to work out the best way of using what's at his disposal. It's not going to be a situation where he brings in a load of players in January. He'll want to work with what he's got. On the Atletico side of things, they have all manner of attacking players. Luis Suarez, Joao Felix, Antoine Griezmann, Mateus Cunha. They're not getting the best out of them at the moment. And they're picking up results in La Liga that they shouldn't be. They lost at home to Mallorca the other week. That was a really poor result. They made some chances against Real, but weren't particularly convincing at the weekend. So Diego Simeone has to find that balance between attack and the defence that has served them so well in the last few years. So that is one of the most gripping ties because both teams have quite big flaws at the moment. Just quickly into Milan, what difference are, are, are Liverpool going to face from, you know, Antonio Conte's into Milan? In terms of the in terms of the threat level from one draw to the next, Liverpool have had one of the the kind of toughest ones because I think they would have had a fairly easy time against Salzburg, but against Inter, this is much tougher. It's interesting you compare them to the Conte team. So obviously they lost Conte, lost Lukaku, lost Hakimi. They're big, big players to lose. What I really like about Inter is that Simone Inzaghi has managed to dispel that negativity. He's managed to put in a system where the players are enjoying themselves. The signings have worked. Edin Dzeko looks good. Joaquin Correa has contributed as well. Hakan Chalanolu has been superb since coming from Milan. So that's a team that has lots of confidence, lots of firepower and a good, solid spine to the team. And just a quick one on uh, some. A lot of people will be saying uh, hashtag pray for Salzburg. They've got Bayern Munich, but intrigued by um, Karim Adeyemi, who was I think he was at Bayern Munich as a kid, gone to Salzburg, ripped it up. He's been linked with Dortmund, been linked with a big move away. Even Bayern have been linked with taking him back uh, as well. If he is still at Salzburg come this uh, this tie, he will be keen to prove a point, won't he? Yeah, he will. It's a great opportunity for him to show what he can do on German soil. He's a guy that has played senior football for Germany now. I'd expect him to be part of the World Cup squad. He's been brilliant in the Champions League group stage. Some really enterprising performances. He's quick. He's lively. Dortmund, it is believed, are uh, ahead of everybody else in the race. But that deal probably wouldn't go through in January. It will probably be one at the end of this season. So I think he will play in the last 16 for Salzburg. And he's the kind of player that could cause Bayern one or two problems. I think Bayern will win the tie. I, I don't think there's much doubt about that. But they do have a high defensive line. And I think centre-back is where you can get at them. So I do think Adiemi, with his runs in behind, can cause some damage. Fascinating stuff, Kev. Thank you very much. And, and thanks for not being your way for and not messing it up. That was, that was great. <laughs> not uh, this really time. appreciate it. Uh, it's Drive on Talksport with WeBuyAnyCar.com. They settle any outstanding finance so you don't have to.